Hello, welcome to Legal Awareness web series. We have a very special and distinguished guest this morning, uh, Lieutenant General Zamiruddin Shah, uh, veteran of Indian Army, who was in fact born on our Independence Day on August 15, 1948, uh, has served Indian Army for many decades, has many uh, distinctions and awards to his credit, uh, General Shah was trained at National Defense Academy and Indian Military Academy and was commissioned in 1968 into 185 Light Regiment Camel Pack. He participated in 1971 War of Liberation of Bangladesh at Longowala, Jaisalmer sector. Subsequently, he was actively involved in the anti-insurgency operations in Northeast during Operation Parakharan. Uh, General, uh, he was the general officer who commanded Indian Infantry Division. Uh, for his distinguished services, he was given Param Vishisht Seva Medal and Seva Medal and Vishisht Seva Medal. He was also a member of the Armed Forces uh, uh, Tribunal. This tribunal was uh, constituted under the Armed Forces Tribunal Act 2007 and it uh, decides cases under the Arms Act 1950, Navy Act under 1957, and Air Force Act 1950. It operates like the High Court, and it is also supposed to follow the High Court's procedure. He is also a writer, and his biography is widely read, a widely traveled person, has been an academic administrator and vice chancellor of a leading central university of India. Uh, General Shah, welcome to Legal Awareness Web Series. Uh, of course, the entire country wants to listen to you about uh, what is happening on uh, uh, Indo-China relations. But first of all, uh, let me ask you a most fundamental question about your career in Army and tell us about the difficult situations you handled on border. Uh, it's always a pleasure, uh, Professor Faisan, to be interacting with you. You covered most of my career. I'd like to highlight that I joined as a 15 and a half year old at NDA. So the army believes in catching officers young. So I was commissioned when I was still in my team. Anyway, uh, you've covered the 1971 war. I was at Longewala. But what I'd like to tell you is that more demanding than conventional operations are counterinsurgency operations. These are operations against your own countrymen. So you have to be very, very cautious. You don't know when you're going to be hit. You don't know when you are traveling, when you'll be ambushed, when you'll face an IED. Or when I was a major, we had the unfortunate incident of an attack on one of our posts at Fekmile in Nagaland, where a platoon post was overrun by the Naga um, hostiles. And we lost a large number of people. So it has been like that. Then uh, as a brigade commander, I was involved in insurgency in the Northeast. Before that, as a colonel, I was in, involved in insurgency in the Punjab, which was a different sort of kettle of fish. Then I commanded a division of a strike in the strike corps. You already covered that my, uh, it was not Parakaram. My division was tasked to quell the riots in Gujarat which they did very effectively within two days of induction. Subsequently, I commanded Bengal area, which was created for the defense of the Siliguri corridor. This is the 22 kilometer wide corridor between Bangladesh, India and Bhutan. It's a strategically a very, very important location. Then I, when I became a Lieutenant General, I commanded a corps in Dimapur, this was responsible for all the northeastern states. And then uh, my before retirement, I was appointed as the deputy chief of army staff, uh, where I was responsible for the army budget and the modernization. So I do know the budgetary constraints and I'm well aware how long it takes to induct new equipment. It's not like that you're buying from a supermarket of the shelf. No, there are various procedures pretty complicated for acquisition of arms and ammunition. So these are problems which I would like to highlight. 
very good sir so sir uh, sir since our legal awareness web series is about law uh, let me first of all ask you about the applicability of laws in army and how is court martial done and do you really follow due process of law right i mean this is uh, you know having been member of the aft uh, the first question i was asked was do you know enough about law well i said i do know military law and then i said adjudication of justice is common sense plain common sense a judge has to use his common sense and he'll understand well, the laws in the army are governed by the army act of 1950 and it gives it includes inherent law of natural justice that means it is ensured that natural justice is not only seen but in, uh, well uh, follow now in case of a, uh, a crime so called crime i'll just explain the procedures the first thing is that the commanding it is brought to the notice of the commanding officer that so and so committed an offense or a crime or whatever you term it the commanding officer orders a court of inquiry the inquiry finds out the details to be put up to the commanding officer during the entire process of the inquiry the person who is guilty who is guilty of the offense is present and he can cross examine all the witnesses and put in any queries so it is not a question of a thanada doing an inquiry no it is a it is a laid down that the person against whom the inquiry is to be done is to be present and he can question any amount and also give a statement in the inquiry after the inquiry is done the commanding officer the the uh, person who has committed the offense is arranged before the commanding officer that means it is a formal interview of the commanding officer now the commanding officer can decide three things either he can dismiss the charges after reading the court of inquiry and going through the interview or he can dispose of the charge or he can order a summary of evidence that means he can order a summary of evidence which will put the evidence on record now disposal of the charge can be done at this stage and a, a, a commanding officer can punish an uh, an other rank with maximum of 28 days rigorous imprisonment and 14 days detention the difference between the two is that in rigorous imprisonment the uh, person uh, so charged loses pay and allowances for that number of days in detention he is only locked up and made to do physical labor but he does not lose his pay and allowances so in service i always prefer detention to rigorous imprisonment but it was given whenever required uh, professor fazan i'd like to bring out one aspect see we spent a lifetime in the regiment that means jawans who have joined with us grow up with us they have faced the same hazards they have played games with us and let me tell you that for a commanding officer to to punish a jawan of his unit can be a very very well um, it, it is um, uh, very very difficult for a commander of this family member because obviously he has become a friend now suppose my own sevada was to be produced to me uh, on a charge i would think twice before giving him punishment anyway once the commanding officer has given the punishment or if he is felt that the case should be heard by a court martial it is subsequently a summary of evidence done now there are four types of court martials the first is a summary court martial a summary court martial can be can uh, try only other ranks and the maximum punishment it, is, it can give is one year the next punish the next sort of court martial is a district court martial where uh, three members minimum have to be members of the district court martial 
uh, it can award two years rigorous imprisonment maximum. Next stage is the summary general court martial. This is resorted to only in operational areas where there's a paucity of officers and officers cannot be made available. It can award sentences up to death. And the last is the general court martial. Minimum required is five members. It can be more depending on the degree of the charge. The punishment can be awarded, can be a death sentence. There are some crimes or charges which cannot be dealt with by a court martial. For example, murder, um, rape of a person who is not subject to the charge. So these are all very, very constricting uh, uh, things which uh, ensure fair play and justice. Yes. So these are the types of court martials in the army. I hope I have uh, cleared your doubts. Yeah, you have cleared our doubts and uh, it seems that you have uh, benches of court martial. So you have five people sitting uh, and the person concerned who has been charged is treated as a family member. So it is very, very difficult to really punish him. Now, since you are also a member of the Armed Forces Tribunal, uh, tell us something about the functions of this tribunal and how it conducts its proceedings. Now, let me explain why the Armed um, uh, Forces Tribunal was formed. It was under the Armed Forces Act of uh, 2009. It was felt that education or appeals against court martial sentences were dragging on for years at considerable expense to the litigants. So an armed forces tribunal was instituted. It comprises of several benches all over the country. And a bench com comprises of one either Supreme Court or High Court judge and another service officer of the rank of general. The purpose was to reduce the administrative time taken in appeals by people who are aggrieved. It cannot alter the sentence of a court martial. It can either strike it down or uphold a sentence. Uh, most of the, uh, a few things are beyond the purview of the uh, Armed Forces Tribunal. One is sentences of, of summary court martials and punishments awarded by a commanding officer and summary disposal. An Armed Forces Tribunal cannot uh, adjudicate on these matters because it was felt that these, these punishments had been given on the spot to impose discipline and good order. So these are beyond the purview of the uh, Armed Forces Tribunal. Besides uh, court martials, the Armed Forces Tribunal dealt with cases of uh, annual confidential reports. Uh, not getting promotions, pay and allowances. These are some of the other matters which were uh, considered. Now, there's a mistaken impression that uh, military justice is rough and ready and presumptuous. These are the, uh, the wrong ideas which brother judges who we sat in the benches had, and we had to clarify. We had to tell them that no, there's a there's a long and detailed procedure for administrating for administering justice, and it is not presumptuous and not at the whims of the commanding officer. So that is uh, about the Armed Forces Tribunal. Uh, what I'd like to stress is that it cannot and will not adjudicate. Uh, summary disposal. I would also like to say that one aspect where we did not give any relief in the in, in the uh, trials uh, of the Armed Forces Tribunal was cases of cowardice. Uh, we felt there were large representations. Some some JSTOs and OR had been dismissed for cowardice. We felt that this would uh, destroy military justice and we never entertained those cases were always rejected
good so uh, sir straight away can i now take you to the recent indo china dispute uh, what must be the reason of our soldiers not firing when they had this quarrel with the uh, chinese uh, soldiers in leh well that is something that i have not been able to understand myself See, there are four things which a soldier always has with him. One is his headgear, either his helmet or his cap. The second is his belt, where he keeps his ammunition and other arms. The third is his boots. And the most important are his personal weapon. And personal weapon is something that a soldier has been trained to use and fire in case his life is threatened. I don't know if our soldiers were working under the constraints of no escalation orders given at the border if that was so i think it was improper rules of engagement happily now those have been changed i think our soldiers were constrained from using their weapons because of the restrictions of the rules of engagement which said no escalation within the 20 kilometers belt of the of the line of actual control so that 1996 and uh, 2005 rules which the two uh, governments have agreed to that's right but they tied down the uh, the uh, the army ranks and i wish that uh, weapons had been used after all it was a question of life and death and um, uh, it is, uh, well, it would be less of a grief in case one falls to an enemy's bullet rather than being clubbed to death. Correct. So do you think, sir, that such kind of incidents like uh, Galvan are common when uh, during the talks uh, uh, you have pushing and shoving resulting in slipping of few soldiers in such treacherous mountainous region? Well, this has been having right through, except in 1967, when the Chinese tried to uh, try to make ingress into Sikkim. Uh, but uh, because of no escalation uh, rules of engagement, this has been going on, and this has been going on for a large time. Always there has been problems, but it has been de-escalated. Unfortunately, at, in the Galwan Valley, it did not work. So this now this let me tell you. The Chinese are a very predictable people. Whenever they take offensive action, they do it in five stages. One is they threaten, then they warn, then they demonstrate. Now, we are at stage three, where they are demonstrating or trying to demonstrate superiority, their prowess. Next is they attack. And fifth is they withdraw. So I'll repeat again. Uh, well, uh, these are five stages. They've done this in 1962. They did it in uh, Vietnam conflict, and they're trying to do it again. So um, we are at, I think, the demonstration stage. OK. So sir, now, uh, how significant in your view is Prime Minister's visit to Leh? Do you think reference to Krishna Sudarshan Chakra is warning to China or a war cry? Is Prime Minister following Kotalya's statement of war as an art of deception? Well, uh, this uh, regarding Sudarshan Chakra is a uh, mythology. And I do feel that the Prime Minister's visit indicated a seriousness on the part of India. It did a lot to galvanize the moral convey the right message to China that India was serious. Of course, there was an adverse reaction to his visit uh, by the statement of the of the Chinese uh, ambassador. But I think the visit of the ambassador of the prime minister was in the right direction and very timely. Uh, do you, sir, think that Chinese are on our soil? Satellite images and some experts say that they are there, but our government says that no one has intruded in our territory. As a nation, we want to know, uh, and 
what is your view on this issue well if i go by the what i have seen on television uh, uh, it does indicate i'll tell you what has happened the problem lies in the 20 kilometer belt where it is supposed to be this de-escalated and where there's to be no armed activity the uh, shall i explain how this happened uh, the background of the problem yes sir okay see the problem uh, rises that in 1950 the chinese uh, occupied tibet then in mid 1950s i think 55 56 they constructed a road linking lhasa to xinjiang passing through aksai chin unfortunately india was not aware of the construction of the road and when we sent our scouts it was already too late the road had been constructed now the uh, uh, 19 there was an agreement between india china and tibet in at shimla in 1914 where the MacMoran line was drawn. The MacMoran line indicated the border in the northeast between Tibet and India. The Chinese did not sign that declaration of the MacMoran line. They don't recognize it because they, their stand was that Tibet was not an independent country. So the Chinese representative did not sign the agreement, he only initialed it. Anyway, in 1962, the Chinese launched attacks in the Northeast, in that time, Nefa and Ladakh. They conquered quite a bit of territory up to Bombilla, and then in the Northeast and in the, in the, in the North, they came, they uh, captured the whole of Aksai Subsequently, they did withdraw, but they retained control of Aksai Chin. They withdrew the whole from the whole of, uh, of uh, Nefa, which is now named as Arunachal. But in the north, they did retain control of Aksai Chin to guard their strategic roadway linking Lhasa to the uh, to uh, Xinjiang. So that is where now uh, what happened that in 1987 they, and uh, in 1967 again there was a uh, there was a conflict uh, in Sikkim where the Indian army got the better of the Chinese. They thought that they would come in with the same ease as they did in 1962, but they were taken aback at the at the real routing of chinese troops in 1967 uh, in sikkim there have been periodic uh, well clashes not really armed between uh, between the chinese forces and uh, 67 in sikkim and 75 in arunachal that's right there have been a few minor clashes but they've been de-escalated and status quo has been maintained. Uh, in uh, June this year, the Chinese came into Galwan Valley. This is again a, a question of perception of the demilitarized zone 20 kilometers. The Chinese have one version, the Indian army has another version. So if you believe what the Chinese have to say, then uh, their stand is that we have intruded into their territory, whereas our stand is they have intruded into our territory in um, uh, in uh, in um, in Aksai Chin and also in the Pengongso area in Galwan Valley and in uh, the Pengongso. So it's a difference of perception between the demilitarized zone. Okay, sir, is China therefore implementing Sun Tzu's formula of supreme art of war being to subdue the enemy without fighting and therefore it is expanding its territory without a full-fledged war? Well, I have a Sun Tzu's uh, book. Uh, this is uh, 13 chapters. 
uh, I'm sure that uh, I do hope that our strategists have brought it to the notice of the Prime Minister. Of course, he would have read the Art Shastra, which I read in detail. It, uh, it is uh, uh, a very, very well-defined book, uh, which gives a strategy and lays down everything. Uh, what is important is chapter six of Sun Tzu's uh, Art of War. He says, gently, he occupies the field of battle first is at ease. He who comes later and reaches the field is at a disadvantage. Therefore, those skilled in war bring the enemy to the field of battle by deploying first. This is chapter six of Sun Tzu's Art of War. We should have studied this. We have been saying for a very long time, incidentally, during a, a, a sabbatical in the Army War College, I wrote a dissertation for my MSc degree on the threat from China and the way to deal with it. And I studied Sun Tzu, I studied their techniques, I studied their predictability. And uh, my reading into how to deal with Chinese is that firstly, they have got five times the armed forces of India. Their economy is five times bigger. It will be very, very difficult to compete. But we can do it knowing the fact that Chinese troops last faced conflict in 1987, where they got a bloody nose from a small country like Vietnam. So the Chinese have not faced, the Chinese armed forces have not fa faced conflict since 1987. Our soldiers and armed forces are battle hardened. We've been right at war internally, uh, right through. Uh, we've been facing insurgency, our soldiers are battle hardened. But the lesson which I always thought is less deal with the Chinese the way the Vietnamese did. Their strategy was very simple. They did not deploy regular troops at the border. They only had border troops, border guards at the border, and their regular army units were 20 kilometers in depth. The border guards did put up a bit of resistance, but then they fell back according to a prearranged plan and entice the Chinese into killing grounds. When the Chinese were in the killing grounds, the regular Vietnamese struck and the, the Chinese had no alternative but to withdraw in disgrace. So this is a lesson. Now, our, 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 the, the national policy on the border is no loss of territory. I think it needs to be tweaked a little, modified, no loss of territory permanently. That's what I would say. This loss of territory is that you are deployed your regular troops at the show window. No, I think what is required on the show window is paramilitary forces. We have got the Indo-Tibetan Indo border police. Right. Those should be deployed on the show window. In case there should be a wrestling match, let them do it. But certainly, army troops should not be involved in clubbing or fighting. No, they are trained to use weapons and use them effectively. The problem lies, although we have said that one border, one force, we have not implemented it. Unfortunately, the Indo-Tibetan border police does not come under the operational control of the army. That is a lacune, that is a weakness which needs to be corrected. And I think their service conditions are also not comparable to Indian Army. Well, uh, that is a matter of uh, service conditions. But like when I was uh, commanding a three corps on the 
Indo-Burma border, we've got the Assam Rifles. But the Assam Rifles were under operational control of the army. They are under Ministry of Home, but under operational control of the army. It matters a great deal if the paramilitary forces are under operational control. I mean, one border, one force should be implemented and without delay. Good. Very good, sir. Now, next, sir, since line of control is not, as you also said, clearly demarcated, do you think that this Indochina problem is a routine kind of thing and will eventually be sorted out with Chinese agreeing to go back to their April position? I doubt it very much. I doubt it very much. Their aim was to control or to dominate the heights over the newly constructed road from Leh onto Chushul onto Dorot Beg Oldi. They, their efforts will always be to deny the use of this road by the Indian Armed Forces. I doubt it that they will withdraw to their pre-June positions. That is my doubt. But in case our, uh, our skills are good and in case and the Prime Minister can bank on his close relationship with the President of China, we may succeed, although I doubt it. Sir, uh, tell us something about this uh, Doklam uh, tri-junction, you know, between Tibet, Bhutan and India, where after 72 days of standoff, ultimately uh, the problem was sorted out and Chinese withdrew, it seems. Yes, Doklam was the efforts to construct a road in uh, eastern Bhutan. Uh, we uh, resisted this. There were negotiations and the Chinese have stopped the construction, but they have not given up. I mean, I just read the statement. They have not given up claims to central and western Bhutan also. They've also got some problems with Nepal, which they may have uh, uh, sorted out but they have activated the complete border of India. They have activated in uh, the Northeast, in Arunachal Pradesh. They have acti activated Bhutan. They have activated, uh, they've built a, a, a strategic railroad, uh, railway and railroad right up from, uh, up to, uh, up to the uh, Nepalese capital. And also, uh, we are facing the problems in the, in the north, in uh, um, Galwan Valley, and in uh, in the Five Fingers. So they've activated right along the border. Okay. Do you think, sir, since as Deputy Chief of Indian Army, uh, you were involved with budget about army, and uh, now our Defence Minister is saying that we are going to purchase. Uh, arms, uh, uh, you know, for 33,000 crore. Do you think that in terms of ammunition and arms and budgets, our army is well off or more is to be invested? Uh, I think that the, the defense budget needs to be bolstered. Uh, it should be at least 5% of the GDP and not the present at the present level. Also, I'd like to stress that acquisition of arms and ammunition is a time-consuming process. You can't buy things off the shelf. If you do, like we did earlier uh, during Kargil, then you'll get an assortment of weapons and such things. It is a time-consuming process. And I would say that uh, I am not so optimistic about these equipments and weapons and the Air Force jets coming coming as quickly as envisaged. No, they say it will take about two and a half years to three years. I think that's a very realistic time frame. Correct. Sir, I would also like to ask you that uh, in your book, you have written that Indian Army is a different kind of uh, institution, absolutely secular, no talk of religion, no talk of caste. So tell us something sector of Indian Army? Well, I'll not be a hypocrite, Professor Fezan. Uh, let me honestly tell you that during my 40 years of service in the Army, I never felt discrimination at all. 
in fact the commitment of the troops their actions in gujarat in quelling the riots were above politics and above religion they only took action against rioters this is there's no doubt about it that the greatest strength of the indian army is all sections of the population there is no restriction on anybody joining the indian armed forces if there had been discrimination i would probably gone home as a major or a colonel but the army entrusted me and i as deputy chief i was privy to every national secret so this bogey about discrimination is wrong the indian army only selects personnel it only promotes personnel on merit and plain and simple i am not being a hypocrite i stress again sir if you don't mind can we take few questions in uh, uh, hindi and urdu so that uh, my viewers i'll try my best yeah yeah 